It's time to think about the Bible like you never have before. This is Christian Questions. This podcast centers on godly principles, family values, and honest dialogue in a politically free zone. After the podcast, check out our other episodes, all our Bible study resources, videos, download the CQ app, and more at ChristianQuestions.com. Today's topic is, Can Faith Take Me From Failure to Victory? Coming up in this episode, Failure is Miserable. But faith is far more powerful than we think. Unfortunately, most of us have never been taught how to scripturally tap its potential. Let's see if we can connect the Old and New Testament dots to uncover faith's true meaning and its life-changing influence. Now, here's Rick, Jonathan, and Julie. Welcome, everyone. I'm Rick. I'm joined by Jonathan, my co-host, for over 20 years. It's truly a blessing. And Julie, a longtime CQ contributor, is also with us. Great topic today, gentlemen. Jonathan, what is our theme scripture for today's episode? Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. As Christians, we all fail. We all think or say or do things that are out of harmony with God's will and way, and and this can be really frustrating. So what can change those failures? Will, Will focusing on having more faith make a difference? The answer to this is yes and no. Having more faith can only make a difference if we understand what faith really is. For many, having Christian faith is professing a belief. It's looking towards Jesus and choosing to be his follower. While this is appropriate and necessary, it's only a beginning. True faith is far deeper than that. When we look at both the Old and New Testaments together, we see a very different description of faith. This description shows us how we can use true and genuine faith to help take us from failure to victory. So, how does faith work? What we want to do today is start with faith in the New Testament. And faith in the New Testament is a very basic principle that we all know and understand. Faith is always from the same Greek word throughout the entire New Testament. So, Jonathan, let's get into what is that word, that definition of faith? Persuasion, credence, conviction, reliance, and constancy. Okay, very simple, very straightforward. Persuasion, credence, conviction, reliance, and constancy are internal decisions we make when we observe the evidence needed to commit ourselves to an approach or to a cause. So this is an internal process, and it's an absolute Christian necessity. I want to stress, it's an internal process, but it's absolutely necessary. Christian faith, though, requires much more than intellectual and emotional recognition of something. It requires action. Jonathan, let's go to Hebrews 11, 6. And this is from the King James Version. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So our belief should provoke us out of our comfort zone so that we can better seek God. Christian faith has an established standard of action for us to acknowledge and to follow. And this is shown to us in Jude chapter 1, verse 3. And this is again from the King James Version. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So we have a clear heritage of this true gospel and those who were tasked with its care and its expansion. That's what Jude is telling us. You've got that heritage, you've got to follow through in that heritage. And and Hebrews was telling us that it's not possible to please God without faith. We have to pursue him. So there's definitely action involved. So to just put a basic lesson together from faith to victory from failure to victory, Jonathan, what do we have? Faith in the New Testament is very focused on understanding and accepting the gospel message through Jesus. Most New Testament references to faith focus on our making Jesus and the gospel the centerpiece of our lives. And that's an important factor. The object of faith in the New Testament is very much built around making Jesus our centerpiece, and that is critical, and we're not minimizing that. However, we need to go further. 
This New Testament foundation for the Christian is important. Now let's take a look at faith in the Old Testament, because it has a slightly different approach. And I thought it was interesting that the word faith only appears twice in the King James Version for the Old Testament. That's Deuteronomy 32.20 and Habakkuk 2.4. The words faithful, faithfulness, and believing are more common. And we see that faith is all over the New Testament, but it shows up sporadically, but dramatically in the Old Testament. So Old Testament faith is very action oriented and it really focuses on believing and we're going to see that that's going to extend far beyond an intellectual affirming so let's see how we come to that kind of a conclusion let's look at old testament faith in its action orientation um and l- let's take a look at the first time one of the words for faith for believing is used in the bible it's genesis chapter 15 verses 5 to 6 and it's in reference to abram And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then to he, Abram, believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him righteous. So the idea of Abram's faith was it this, this this is a word for believe and again julie said it before the word faith just doesn't appear in all of these actions and and accounts of the old testament the word for believe here is all about action it's all about devotion so jonathan let's just get a quick definition of that particular old testament word to build up or support foster as a parent or nurse figuratively to render or be firm or faithful to trust or believe to be preeminent or quiet, uh, morally, morally to be true and certain. And here's a fun fact. Our English word amen, which means so be it, is derived from this word used here for believe. So it has the sense of reliable, being firm and trustworthy. And so when, when you say amen, you're entering into uh, the thoughts of the prayer. And, and there's a beautiful action involved in that. So this saying that Abraham was, fir- this, this, this word, you know, Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. This word is saying that Abraham was firm in his devotion to God. It, wasn't a, it was about much, much more than the promise of having a son. It was about his living in a devoted way, no matter what would happen happen, no matter what would come. It's also interesting that a form of this word is used to describe God as faithful in this same devoted way. And Jonathan, let's go to our theme text, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And this word translated faithfulness in the Old Testament means literally firmness, figuratively, security, and morally, uh, morally, fidelity. So what you have here is the same thing. There's an action in the faithfulness of God. He's faithful. He's firm. He's trustworthy. He's immovable when it comes to his human creation. He does things for us. When God, it says God is faithful, he doesn't just intellectually think of us. He acts on our behalf. And this is a huge understanding of faith in the Old Testament. God recognized this high level of devotion in Moses as well. Numbers chapter 12, verses 7 to 8. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful. Rick, uh, same word as with Abram. He was faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then are you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? So the scripture is just verifying. Moses was what? He was firm in his devotion to God. Where God led, Moses followed. What God instructed, Moses did. See, faith was doing very clearly in the Old Testament. Moses being faithful is really saying that he was firm in his obedience to God on all levels. And we need to make sure we understand that as a basis, as a foundation for this conversation about going from failure uh, to victory through faith, because we're seeing 
action. We're seeing things that we have to do. So from failure to victory, Julie, what's our, what's our wrap up for this? Faith in the Old Testament is all about action. And it's about firm allegiance and obedience. God himself modeled this firm allegiance with his own protection and punishment of those who followed him. And for us, going from failure to victory requires our faith to be built on intellectual assurance, heart reliance, and actions that reflect allegiance and obedience. Can't stress enough. Faith that we're looking at is built on actions as well as that intellectual assurance and that heart reliance that we're always so familiar with, and rightfully so. So true faith then really needs to be an all-encompassing basis of our lives. This means that there's a lot to learn. We now know more about what faith is. How can we practically apply it to leading us through trials? As we examine faith and its power, we're going to use several accounts from the life of Joshua. It's interesting to note that in the entire book of Joshua, the words for faith that we previously discussed don't appear at all. I mean, they're not there. And so if that's the case, why use him as an example? Because Joshua exemplified firm obedience and allegiance to God. So we're looking at a book of the Bible that doesn't have a word for faith in it as a basis for a faith lesson. Let's see how this unfolds. So here's how Joshua began leading Israel. God unequivocally appointed Joshua to lead. And we're going to give this leading, these, the, the, the faith in, in the book of Joshua and Joshua himself, a, a kind of a special name. So what is this first special label for faith here? The obedience factor is his basis for success. Joshua 1, 1 through 3. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am going to give to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you just as I spoke to Moses. So there's something powerful happening here. God's preparing and directing Joshua by telling him that he's continuing Moses' work. Let's just pause there for a second and let that sink in. Imagine following after Moses, this incredible leader who, by God's grace and direction, frees millions of people from slavery with his staff in his hand. And now Moses dies, and God comes to you and says, okay, you're taking his place. I mean, talk about feeling overwhelmed. That's scary. It is. And, and Joshua is given this, and he's saying, I'm going to deal with you in a similar fashion as I dealt with Moses. So there's a great assurance here for Joshua. So now, when we're talking about the obedience factor, next, God displays his own faith, his firm allegiance to Joshua, and to the cause of Israel. Let's go to Joshua chapter uh, 1, verses 5 to 6. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. So these are very powerful promises from God to Joshua, who is now the leader of Israel. Uh, Can you imagine having God speak to you and clearly say, I will not fail you or forsake you, and your end of the bargain is to be just strong and courageous and do the work you're supposed to do. So the Christian receives that assurance when Jesus tells us in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, to take my yoke upon you. There's work to do, but we do it with Jesus, and we know our Father won't fail us or forsake us either. So we have that same faith connection, but it's about work. It's about doing things. It's about actions. So we've got uh, the introduction and the big, strong promise. Now, next in Joshua, God instructs Joshua as to how to live up to his responsibilities and the promises he was given. Let's continue in Joshua Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. And and Jonathan, I'm going to interrupt you a couple times. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it 
to the right or to the left so that you will have success wherever you go. So there's success involved and there's clarity involved in making sure you're strong and you keep the law with you. Verses eight, uh, verse 8 next. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. You notice how often God brings up the idea of success. You have to have success, and here are the things you need to do so you can be successful, because you're the leader. You are the one responsible for all these people. And let's finish with verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Well, Rick and Julie, I count five instructions for success. One, be strong and courageous. Two, do all according to the law. Three, do not turn from it to the right or to the left. And four, don't let the law depart from your mouth. And finally, five, meditate on the law day and night so you will do all that's written in it. And as long as we're counting, did you notice (laughs) how many times he says, be strong and courageous? three separate commands. So this next event must be really dangerous. And so the key is God is preparing Joshua for something enormous. He's preparing him to take this land of Canaan as the leader of Israel. And the key is God is planting the, the, the necessary ingredients so Joshua can actually act in faith. See, God requires allegiance and obedience. We've said that many times, and we're seeing that as he prepares Joshua now. Our compliance with this requirement of obedience and allegiance is a profound expression of our own faith. So we've looked at the obedience factor for Joshua and how he had to cling to the law and he had to be strong and courageous and follow exactly what God said and keep things exactly in order. What about our obedience factor? Julie, let's go to Romans 12.1 for the Christian perspective here. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, a sacrifice gives up its life for the sake of honoring God, and we are that holy offerings and living sacrifices. We're doing God's will instead of our own. That's the action part of our faith. So the idea of being a living sacrifice is an action. It's not just a thought. It's not just a heartfelt sentiment. It is action. We have to be that sacrifice. That is the point of understanding the depth of faith. So when we look at Going from failure to victory, what do we have so far? True Christian faith cannot be expressed without true obedience to God through Christ. So we're going to ask ourselves a few questions uh, when struggling with failure. What has my obedience factor been in my failures? And have I lived according to sound scriptural principles or rationalized personal preferences? In faith, if we change the basis of our actions, we can change the outcome. And, you know, just a a practical example uh, along the lines of this idea of have I lived according to sound scriptural principles or rationalized personal preferences. I've had lots of experiences by the grace of God, and I really stress that part, to, to be involved in the lives of many who struggled with a lot of things. And with several married couples, one of the issues ends up being that we get so tied up in our lives that the sound scriptural principles get kind of put aside, especially when it comes to our spouse because we're so comfortable with them. And then we start to kind of lean on our own personal preferences. And when that happens, the kind of respect that we started out for with our spouse begins to diminish. And then it turns oftentimes into resentment. And I have seen this exact thing happen where the personal preferences overwhelm the principles of righteousness. And to just simply remind those involved, hey, what have you been following and why? And now what can you do? It's a change. It's a paradigm shift. And that's how faith can take us from failure to victory. We need to recognize and make that shift. Let's go to our next Joshua lesson, the adjustment factor. So Joshua sent two spies ahead of the people into, uh, into the city of Jericho. Now, the king of Jericho is afraid. He's afraid of Israel, and he's watching. He's got everybody on the alert. And we're going to see this in Joshua chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. 
it was told the king of Jericho saying, behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab saying, bring out the men who have come to you and have entered into your house for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. So you have this circumstance, the men get into the city and they're looking around and this woman Rahab finds them and actually hides them from the authorities. Rahab proceeded to send Jericho soldiers not to find the two spies, but she sent them on a wild goose chase to protect those spies. Yeah, it's a classic. They went that away when she's really <laughs> hiding the spies at her house. And for homework, I recommend reading Joshua chapters two and six for Rahab's story. She's controversial. You know, she's a Gentile prostitute in the idolatrous land of Canaan who lies, lies to protect the spies. And as a woman in this environment, she had little hope to change her way of life. But through her contact with men, over the years, she heard the stories of how the God of the Israelites were with them and how he was feared by the surrounding nations. And we actually see that unfold. Uh, next, Rahab speaks to the spies and reveals her reasons for hiding them. And, and this is a very powerful expression of faith without using the word faith. Joshua chapter 2, let's go 9 and 10 to begin with. And said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you 40 years ago when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites whom you utterly destroyed. So, You've got Rahab's confession of Israel's short 40-year history here. She's reciting some of the things they did. She noticed this speaks volumes because they knew what, who Israel was long before Israel got there. Rahab's faith now becomes far more evident through her firm actions of allegiance. Now, her allegiance, we're going to see, is to God, the God of Israel. And she asks for mercy along the way. So now she's talking to these spies, and she's proclaiming what she sees and believes. Uh, Joshua chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. When we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is the God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. So here she is stuck in her circumstances of sin. She sees this sliver of hope that maybe it could be changed. And in her lack, she recognizes that God is the only God displays great allegiance to him by protecting his people, she's obedient to the little part she knows about Israel and this God of heaven. And this is amazing considering the cesspool of paganism that she grew up with. She left her past behind. And think about what an inspiration that is for any of us looking for a do-over. And from their standpoint, the spies weren't expecting help to come from someone like her. You know, that's a lesson for us, too. Yeah, you know, so she leaves her past behind with no guarantee of a future. The only thing she has is her own actions to stand in front of her and say, I believe in your God. This is the way I see it. I, I would like to be protected. I'm asking for mercy for myself and my family. So you've got a very, very powerful expression here. So we've got to ask ourselves, when conquering the enemies of God, let us, through grace and wisdom, be aware of our own surroundings so we can notice God's providences along the way. You see, those spies were aware of their surroundings, and they listened, and they responded in a very, very appropriate way. And let, we'll see that in, in Joshua chapter 2, verse 14. So the men said to her, Our life for yours, if you do not tell the, this business of ours, and it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. So the spy's response is one of wisdom and mercy. 
all of these actions that we see from the two spies as they listened, as they trusted her to hide them, they didn't know who she was. She was an enemy, and yet they trusted her to hide them. They trusted the words she said, and then she trusted them as well. All of these actions were actions of firm allegiance and obedience to the God of heaven, Rahab included. These were all actions of faith. And folks, this is what faith is. We need to understand it is this kind of action. And it's summed up beautifully for us. We jump to the New Testament, and we use the word faith here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Rick, this is a bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It is. It is It is a very specific, very definite bridge. And again, the spies had to adjust. You know, this is that, that adjustment factor. They had to change their strategy because they found a very, very unexpected ally in the middle of enemies. And they trusted an enemy who really was an ally. But you couldn't tell for sure, but they knew they could see the sincerity in her. So you see the adjustment, the dramatic adjustment the spies had to make. What about us? What about our faith as a Christian? What's our adjustment factor? Julie, let's go to Romans 12. We did verse 1. Now let's go to verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And we can intellectually say that we won't be conformed to the world, but it does happen. So we have to continually make adjustments and reset our allegiance because our default is sin. And just real quick, the end of the story of Rahab, she ends up marrying an Israelite from the tribe of Judah. Her son was Boaz, the husband of Ruth. And Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, is her direct descendant. So she actually is part of the genealogy of Christ. So, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, and you see that it was her actions that brought her there. In the next segment, we're going to develop that even further. So when we look at this, and we're going from failure to victory, what do we have so far? To live a life of true Christian faith is to live a life of adjustment. We need to mature, to change, and adjust in Christ. So let's ask ourselves some questions. What has my adjustment factor been in my failures? Have I adjusted to ease the pressures of my experience? Or have I adjusted to follow the principles of righteousness? Let our adjustments be based on firm allegiance and obedience to God through Christ. And, you know, that's something that might be easier said than done. And sometimes it's subtle. The adjustments we need to make are subtle. You know, I had an experience, personal experience recently, where I had um, a very brief hospitalization just a couple of months ago, but it was very serious. I didn't know it was serious. It came up upon me by surprise. And before the hospitalization, the normal events of Rick being Rick were very difficult and they were beginning to weigh a lot. But sitting in the hospital bed, facing some pretty serious things in that very short period of time, it gave me pause and helped me look at at life differently and thinking, you know what? These things aren't burdens, they're blessings. And I came out of that hospital experience with this renewed joy in whatever it is the Lord gives me, whether it's difficult or not. And, you know, it was an adjustment that I personally needed to make to be able to handle the things that the Lord was going to bring me after the hospital because there were a lot more things he had in store that I just wouldn't have been ready for. We need to be able to adjust. So this is faith. It's an action-oriented part of our lives. It's not just intellectual, and it's not just in your heart. It's so important to realize the importance of resetting our actions. We imperfect humans get off course so easily. To go from failure to success through faith is not a natural progress progression. How do we rise above nature? That's a good question. The obedience and adjustment experiences of Joshua so far have given us concrete actions to follow. Now, the next two Joshua lessons are clearly designed to make those previous lessons that we just talked about sink deeply into our hearts and minds. Every Christian needs their faith 
to have visible connections and reminders to their source of strength. What's your source of strength? You need to be able to be reminded of what it is and how to get to it. Our next Joshua lesson, the reverence factor. Okay, so we went from the adjustment factor, now we're to the reverence factor. Let's continue the story. The time had come for Israel to cross the Jordan as the first step to conquering the land. Now, this is a big step. This step would need to be a God-sanctioned step. And Joshua showed his faith by doing exactly what he was instructed to do. And what he was instructed, as we will see, was no small task. Joshua chapter 3, verses 9 to 13. Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now then, take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from each tribe. It shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan will be cut off and the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. The Jordan River here is at full flood stage, and it overflowed its banks, and it's seemingly impossible to cross. And I like the analogy of sometimes we see our circumstances as impassable. But think about this. That overflowing river prevented the enemy Canaanites on the other side from attacking Israel, and their defenses were down because they never imagined that Israel could cross to reach them. And sometimes God's instructed way seems unreasonable or beyond reach. So do we balk at his instruction or will we on faith go out and take the next small step? Well, sometimes what appears to be a negative is a blessing in disguise and part of a larger plan. First Peter 4.12, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happen to you. So the next small step is the next small action. And what, Jonathan, you really nailed it there, what what can seem like a difficulty is actually God's providence to move us forward, but we need to take action. Our faith is not powerful enough if we just think on it and feel it. We have to act on it. So the next part of this account shows literal steps of faith, steps of What is it? It's firm obedience by the priesthood of Israel. Let's go to Joshua chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. So when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and when those who carried the Ark came into the Jordan, and the feet of the priests carrying the Ark were dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of harvest. Remember, there's like 3 million people getting ready to plunge themselves into this swollen, raging river, led by their most priceless and precious possession, the Ark of the Covenant. And some commentaries say that at this point, the river is a mile wide. Can you imagine the excitement and the nervousness as they're approaching the water and nothing's happening? (laughs) (laughs) Actually, that is scary. Yeah, yes. But uh, continuing with verse 16, the waters which are flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap a great distance away were completely cut off. Now, this is really cool. God used natural means with supernatural timing. There had been this landslide a great distance away in a town called, of all things, Adam, and that stopped the flow of the water upstream. Well, the name of the location, of course, reminds us that the curse of death first imposed by mankind was because of the sin of Adam. And by God's providence, just at the appropriate time, there was a stoppage of the Jordan, the curse of death, allowing the Israelites to pass into Canaan. Let's continue in Joshua 3, verse 17. So the people crossed opposite Jericho, And the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. All right. So it's one thing to cross this dry riverbed, but it's another thing to go and stop in the middle and stand there. 
And you've got to see that picture of the Ark of the Covenant being in the middle with the priesthood standing with it, not moving an inch. This was a raging river just, I don't know, an hour ago, a half hour ago, whatever it was. And now they're standing there in the middle as the nation crosses. And so for those who were crossing from the, 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 the side outside of Canaan into Canaan, the Ark of the Covenant was before them as a sober assurance of where God was delivering them to and what they would be delivered through. They saw the Ark in front of them and could move in faith toward that. For those who had already crossed, the Ark of the Covenant was a sober reminder of how they had been led and protected to get to this point. So either way you look at it, that Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God, and it parked itself in the middle of the riverbed, which was now dry, to say to them, I, the Lord your God, am here with you as I get you from one side to the other. So he's with them before, during, and after they crossed. And then the process, what happens? It reverses. That's, that's amazing, because each step the priest took up the bed of the river the water began to flow again and increase in volume, licking at their heels as they walked. As soon as they were on the opposite shore, the Jordan was once again a raging torrent. So you said it very well. There was a natural occurrence with supernatural timing and enough time to get all those people across that river. We're talking millions. It was a big production, and God paved the road. Literally, he paved the road for them with his presence. He showed his action of faith, and the people had to live that faith and follow through. So we see their reverence factor was all based on the presence of God. So now we as Christians, when we want to go from, uh, from failure to victory with our faith, what's our reverence factor? Julie, let's go to Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So for us, we don't have the Ark of the Covenant sitting in the middle of the dry bed of the Jordan River. Or do we? We have the presence of God, this scripture says, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith through Jesus Christ. So it's essentially holding back all of those things that are opposed to us. So we can revere God the Father through our Lord Jesus and stand firm and walk the path that we're supposed to walk. It may not look as dramatic as the crossing of the dry bed of the, of the River Jordan, but it is incredibly dramatic in the transformation of our very lives. So our reverence factor is every ounce as important in our going from failure to victory through a faith that is full of allegiance and obedience. So let's wrap this, this particular piece up. From veil, failure to victory, Jonathan, what do we have? To live a life of true Christian faith, we must position the presence of God in our lives before us and behind us. So what's my reverence factor been in my failure? Can I observe God's presence in where I have been and where I am going? Let us be sure that our reverence for God is driven by firm allegiance in every direction every thought, and every action of our lives. Like God's presence uh, was in the middle of the crossing of the Jordan, his presence is in the middle of our trials if we're doing our best to walk in his son Jesus' footsteps. But I don't think he's going to stay close to us when he's being mocked. And when we get caught up in egregious, willful sins, and I'm thinking of temptation sins like lust, adultery, evil speaking, and so on, I think we have to ask ourselves, Are we reverencing God or are we mocking God by continuing in those kinds of thoughts and actions? And we want to stay in his presence, but doing what we know is wrong and it's associated guilt and shame is going to pull us farther and farther away. We need to be careful. Well, what do you do to guard yourself from your personal weaknesses, whether big or small? We should put up barriers and hedges to restrain ourselves from temptations weaknesses, or falling into old ways. 
And you know, when when you go back in the account of Joshua and the uh, and, and his being given responsibility, what did God tell him over and over? Think about the law. Put the law in your mind. Meditate on the law. Repeat the law. Have it in front of you. Have it behind you. Have it with you. He put up those hedges for him. He said, here's how you do it. For us, it's that spirituality that we need to truly, truly focus on if we are going to revere God. And again, reverence is not just, oh, I love you, God. It's not simply praise. It's not simply worship. It is living it. It is the action of every day that will take us from failure to victory if our faith is active like that. Our next Joshua lesson, the recognition factor. Okay, recognition. Reverence is incredibly important, but it's just the beginning. Just like Israel, we need constant reminders of the depth of that reverence. It has to stay with us. So here in these next verses is how God set up that remembrance for Israel, that recognition of the reverence. They had that moment of reverence and crossing. Well, what about afterwards? Let's look at Joshua chapter 4, verses 2 to 4. Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, and one man from each tribe. So he basically says, in the middle of the riverbed of Jordan, pick 12 stones, one for each tribe. Carry it to the far shore, to the Canaan side of the shore, because this is going to help you keep that recognition of your reverence. And here is, then he tells them why. He lays it out very specifically. Joshua chapter 4, let's go, Jonathan, to 6 and 7. Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, Because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. This was a huge event. After generations of Egyptian slavery and them wandering in the wilderness eating manna, they were not going to be eating manna anymore because they finally are going to enter the promised land. It flows with milk and honey. So the questions for us are, do we stop long enough to be able to recognize the providence of God? And if so, do we stay quiet long enough to appreciate that which we have recognized? So it's, we, we, you know, we can approach reverence, and we understand approaching reverence and, and how important it is, but do we stay quiet enough in our own hearts and minds to maintain it, to recognize it again and again and again and again long after the event? That's what those stones were for. One stone for, for each tribe to recognize again the reverence of God as their ultimate deliverer. Let's continue with Joshua 4, verses 9 to 11. Then Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they are there to this day. For the priests who carried the Ark were standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was completed that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. And the people hurried and crossed. And when all the people had cr finished crossing, the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed before the people. So you have the, the, the ark of the covenant being the first out into the middle and the last, last out of the middle, and, and the priesthood along with it. Joshua recognized and acknowledged the faith and strength of those priests. They were the first ones in and the last ones out. So they stood in what would have been harm's way longer than anybody. And they, and they were in the middle of this temporarily dry riverbed. Millions of Israelites crossed this Jordan. Those stones may not have ever been seen anymore because they were taken from the shore and put into the middle of the river. They may have never been seen by another person, but God knew they were there because it was marking the pathway, marking the presence of God. And even though it can't be seen by anyone, the Father sees it and he appreciates it. This is faith. This is firm allegiance in action. 
So there were 12 stones visible on land taken from the Jordan and a second set of 12 stones assembled on the riverbed where they would not be visible, both as reminders of this event. This second set of stones appears in many translations, but not all. So we've got tremendous lessons of things that are seen to remind us and things that are unseen to remind us. Let's look, that was the recognition factor for Israel crossing the Jordan to be able to take the land of Canaan. What about us? What about we as Christians when we have to go through difficult experiences to face the next experience? What is our recognition factor? Julie, let's go to Philippians 4, 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So the idea of rejoicing, being anxious for nothing, in everything by prayer, uh, with thanksgiving, making, letting your requests be made known to God, letting the peace of God, letting the peace of God come into you. That's how we recognize the power of God's providence, and the power of his spirit in our lives. That's action. That's not just thinking. It's doing. We have to live a life of faith so we can reap the blessing of a life of faith. So looking at these experiences now, going from failure to victory, Jonathan, what do we have here? To live a life of true Christian faith, we must pause and recognize the power of God's deliverance. And here we're going to ask, What has been my recognition factor been in my failures? And can I recall pausing and recognizing God's hand in the matter? Or do I simply remember the thoughts of my mind and the pressures around me? Let us reverently pause and seek to intentionally recognize God's direction. So we need a way to actively place these metaphorical stones of remembrance. And I'll give you the example of my sister. She keeps a prayer journal to help her see in black and white the breadcrumbs God may be giving her to follow. And like many of us, she had a poor habit of praying and not watching for the outcome. And deliberately recognizing a definitive outcome to specific prayers has strengthened her faith. And she regularly reviews the book, and I regularly hear about it, to see how often the Lord led her through difficult situations that she would have otherwise forgotten. So she writes down when the answer is no or doesn't turn out the way she expected. It's like when the spies got help for Rahab, from Rahab. That was They didn't expect that because these are answered prayers, and we accept that his will be done, no matter what the answer is. And that's such a powerful point. These are answered prayers. These are steps that we can follow and assurances that give us the ability to have a faith that is actually active. And that's how you go from failure to success through faith. So when faced with the pressures of our world, reverence to recognition of God's will is easily clouded. Obedience, adjustment, reverence, and recognition. How do we conclude our journey to success through faith? Well, the conclusion, the grand finale of this journey is profound, but not at all surprising. We've examined many aspects of faith in action, which, according to Joshua's experiences, are firm obedience to God. Our final lessons are the logical conclusions of any good teaching. And those logical conclusions are simple. Know your objective, know your objective, and then follow through. So this brings us to the conclusion of these particular lessons of Joshua and faith. Okay, here's our next Joshua lesson, the following factor. Now, remember, all of these people, these millions of people, got to miraculously cross the Jordan River, and now they're on the other side, and now they come to the city of Jericho, and what do they find? this huge city with these immense walls and these heavy fortifications. And it's like, well, wait, you delivered us through the what? river. That's right. <laughs> and now we have to face this. So, you know, it's, it's going from faith to faith, from action to action. How do you do that? Well, watch what Joshua did. As Joshua is about to undertake what looks like an impossible situation, God again shows his faithfulness to Joshua in assuring him of his mission. For Joshua, the message would be, lead by following. Lead by following. Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. 
Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho. Then he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? He said, No, rather I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to this servant? The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Well, here are some observations. The angel is not on anyone's side. He stands for the Lord God only. And Joshua immediately displays great reverence. And Joshua asks for guidance. And the angel proclaims his visit holy, and Joshua complies. Lead by following. And I love the fact that Joshua confronts this soldier, says, whose side are you on? And the answer is, I'm not on your side. I'm on the side of the Lord God. I am captain of the Lord God. And Joshua's immediate response is, tell me, tell me what it is I need to know. And he is humble before that because God is not on our side. We need to be on his. So that's the following factor that you see Joshua being confronted with. And he's going to be given very specific instructions by this angel. But what about our following factor? What about us as Christians in our difficulties in going from failure to victory and and applying our faith? Julie, let's go to Matthew 26, 38 and 39. And this is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then he said to them, his apostles, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus had, as a man, he had a very specific preference involved in this whole crucifixion process. And he put it before the Lord, God, and he said, If it's possible, can you remove this piece? And we're not going to get into all of that at this moment. But the point is, Jesus himself put what was on his heart and mind before the Lord God. And the way he finished that prayer was, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That is the following factor. If Jesus could put his preference from that perfect humanity before the Lord God, we certainly must be willing to follow wherever our Father leads us, because that's what Jesus did. So as you look at going from failure to victory in regards to our faith, what do we have in relation to this following factor? To live a life of a true Christian faith, we must always be focused on following no matter what the circumstance. So our questions are, what has my following factor been in my failures? And have I continually followed godliness or have I led the way with my own thinking and instincts? Let us always follow, even when called upon to lead or be an example. So I've had quite a sad week because um, in studying for this, I really wanted to sit down and think about what my failures are and how I could turn those into victories. And unfortunately, I found a long list of failures, (laughs) and so I wasn't happy about it. Um, And I'll I'll give you one example. Our emotions, I think, can easily get in the way of our victory. And my failures too often involve anger, frustration, and other very strong emotions. And it's especially disheartening to me when it occurs with my husband. So marriage is sacred. It's precious. But after 25 years, everyone isn't at their, as I call it, their first date best. 100% of the time. And I fail when I go to bed angry because we can, we can have disagreements, no problem. Everything is all good. But when I go to bed angry, which you're not supposed to do, contrary to scriptural advice, I end up waking up even angrier and, you know, you're not supposed to let the sun go down in your anger. And then I get mad at myself (laughs) because I did that. It's just a, it's a really bad cycle of failure. And Julie, I really understand because my failure at this time is being impatient and frustrated with my wife over driving directions. Okay. After moving nine months ago and living in a new area, I get so frustrated with my wife and Siri. I thought about <laughs> asking Siri, uh, you know, I, I think uh, 
I thought after asking Siri to look up a lot of Bible citations, she was being converted to Christianity. But no, (laughs) no, she still gets us lost. So Jewel gets upset when I won't wait two minutes for her to put directions in the GPS. And then I blame her when we take a wrong turn starting off on our destination. So I've decided to work on going from failure to victory by singing the hymn, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, until she has the GPS set. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay, so that's all the way my Savior leads me, not all the way my Siri leads me. You see? You, got you, see, you make that <laughs> paradigm shift, and you see it. And look, there, there's, there's great power in recognizing our experiences in this way and acting in such a way to change what we saw into the way we can see the same thing. So those are really good experiences, even though they're very difficult. They're really good because it helps us to understand my own thinking and my own instincts versus uh, the following godliness at every turn in every circumstance. Our next Joshua lesson, the follow through factor. Okay. So we went from the following factor to the follow through factor. Joshua now instructs the people to exactly as God had commanded, even though it seems kind of odd. Six days of circling the city, one time. And they were following their priests, not their soldiers. Right, right. So this is odd, okay? Joshua 6, 15 to 17. Then on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawning of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now, there's no record of any of these marchers complaining, but can you imagine? They're wondering how walking in a circle is going to capture this huge fortified city. And of course, they knew walking in a circle in the wilderness could be part of God's plan for them. So again, we see their their obedience now and allegiance and a complete trust in God can sometimes seem to us to be unreasonable. But there's no doubt that the victory was from God and not because of the military might of the Israelites. Continuing in verse 17, the city shall be under the ban, and it and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who were with her in the house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. So the instructions were precise. And you guys mentioned how important they were, even though they seemed odd. Aside from taking the city and sparing Rahab her and her family, No one was to take even one little trinket for their own as spoils of battle. Not one. Yeah, but what happened? A man named Achan disobeyed, as if the Lord wasn't going to notice, and hid for himself a Babylonian robe, 200 silver coins, and a bar of gold that weighed over a pound. He stole the treasure set apart for the Lord. And when Joshua confronts him in Joshua 7.21, the man said, get this, I wanted them so much that I took them. And think about how relevant that is to us today. And then he said, they're hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. So if someone had happened upon the first few items, they would think that was it. But there was a second level of hidden illicit treasure. What lengths do we go to hide our sins from the Lord and others? Achan and his family are killed for his for, the, for his disobedience. So you see a follow through in his uh, circumstance. That is that is a heinous sin against God. We need to follow through in the appropriate way, and God gave the appropriate commands. Further, Joshua, remember the, the situation with Rahab. Joshua was very specific about honoring his agreement with her, the agreement that the spies had made. We're going to touch on that in Joshua chapter six, verses twenty two to twenty three, and then verse twenty five. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the harlot's house and bring the woman and all she has out of there as you have sworn to her. So the young men who were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all she had. They also brought out all her relatives and placed them outside the camp of Israel. And she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day, for she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. So you have great faith. You've got firm allegiance and firm obedience to God, and it brought all of these, all of those who had faith were were able to receive a blessing, and Rahab is included. And remember, you've got the, the, the spies, the interesting point is the same two individuals 
who talked to Rahab were sent to confirm her presence and to, to keep her safe. So you see Joshua really following through on this. And we have New Testament confirmation in Hebrews 1130. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after the Israelites had marched around them for seven days. Israel took Jericho by faith, not by force. See, I told you this book of Joshua is a book about, a, about great faith. And even though the word faith never appears in the entire book, the lessons of faith are abundant because you don't need the word when you see faith in action. And that's exactly what we saw. So now let's look at our follow-through factor as Christians. We've seen Joshua and Israel act in great faith with a couple of uh, bad exceptions there. But what's our follow-through factor? Julie, let's go to Philippians 4, 8, and 9. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is ever of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, Dwell on these things, the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So our follow-through factor is really simple. Keep your mind focused on those things that are spiritually beneficial. As you go through all of your physical life, dwell on those things, those principles of godly righteousness that guide you through all of the physical trials and tribulations, so you can see them through the eyes of an active faith, a faith that is full of allegiance to God. So, Jonathan, let's go finally from failure to victory. Uh, what do we have? To live a life of true Christian faith, we must be committed to not only learning and absorbing, but following through. So here's a few questions. What has my follow-through factor been in my failures? Have I stayed the course of obedience? Or have I subtly rewritten the rules to suit my preference? And it's saying things like this. I wanted them so much that I took them. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? Hmm. Coveting is a huge obedience killer. We want what we want, and we can justify nearly anything. I deserve it. They don't deserve it. But we're in love. I didn't mean to. I'm only doing it online, not in person. So sometimes that's a problem, but sometimes it's hard to follow through when obedience doesn't make sense. Like, love your enemies, turn the other cheek. And following through means to be a dependable person, be reliable. If we say we're going to do something, we need to do it. And here's a quote from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. We cannot do a kindness too soon for you never know how soon it will be too late. So we put all this together, and Jonathan, let's go back to that Lamentation Scripture one more time, because this is God's example of His faith to us. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great are the actions and allegiance of God toward us as his human family. As we grow in faith, we grow our firm allegiance to God. Let us obey, adjust, reverence, follow, and follow through on all things. In so doing, faith can take us from failure to success. And folks, this is an important lesson because we often think about faith in terms of our mind and our hearts. But we're here to tell you that Joshua's lessons in faith are much bigger because we have to act. Failures, we can see now failures as opportunities to learn, opportunities to change, opportunities to grow. How do I act, not just think, but act in relation to my failures? Failure can drain you. It could be like a snowball that you make and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and so big you can't even move it. What do you do with that? You melt it. With the, with the warmth of the sun of righteousness. That's what you do. That's an active faith. That's how we have to live. Live with active faith. Think about it. Listen, folks, we really do want to hear from you. Give us your feedback or send us your questions on this episode or other episodes at ChristianQuestions.com. Also, a big part of spreading the word about our podcast is subscribing to Christian Questions in your favorite podcast channels, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate us and review us. We greatly appreciate it. Coming up next week, we talked about faith and the liveliness of that. Next week, how do we keep hope alive. 
How do we keep hope alive? Talk to you then.